So hi everyone, thank you for your patience and welcome to First Tuesday. First Tuesday is a web monthly webinar offered by the Washington State Library on a variety of topics that we believe are interesting to the library community and to the community at large actually. So first of all, we just have a little bit of housekeeping. Let's see if I can make this work right. So here we are. Jeremy is not in today, but we have Joe Olivar, who is our technical support. So if anyone has any difficulty hearing or getting in, you can give Joe a call or send him an email. I believe Joe is gonna put this contact information into the chat also, so you can refer back to it. This picture up here is me, which we'll move on from that. <laughs> I would like to let you know that the webinar is brought to you by the Office of Secretary of State, of which the Washington State Library is one of the divisions. And also we're funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. So we would like to thank our sponsors. Today, we have a great topic and a very important topic, which is keeping it private, navigating the balance of public data and privacy protections. And as you all know, in this internet world, um, that is a very delicate balance. So we're very excited to have an expert. Will Sanders, who is from the Office of Privacy and Data Protection is here. So let me tell you a little bit about Will. Will is the guy who is responsible for the state of Washington's open data efforts. He's also part of the Office of Privacy and Data Protection, which is a new-ish group in, in the CIO's office created to assess state privacy practices and to protect and educate citizens. He's worked on communication and technology issues for the state since 2005, including work in telephone regulation and economic development. He's admitted to the bar in Washington and Maine and is a graduate of the IPMA's UW Leader Path program. So that is Will, and I have one more thing to say and then I'll turn it over to you, Will, which is at the very end when you close down this webinar window, You'll see popped up on your screen, you should have a survey, monkey survey. It's four quick questions. We need to gather data for our um, IMLS reporting. It would be really great if you could fill it out. And if I can remember, I'll say that again at the end. And now, take it away, Will. Good morning, uh, I'm Will Saunders. I just posted my email address in the chat box if you all enjoy that kind of interaction. And I'd be happy to answer questions um, any point during the conversation or during the presentation, there are a few natural breaks. And if we can't get to any of your questions or thoughts, please feel free to drop me an email. I'd be happy to follow up afterwards. So, Will, I am not yet seeing your slides. So, okay. G, I'm going to hit stop share on mine and hope that it will show up for you. So, okay. Actually, Will just needs to take over the share. Okay. Can you see me now? I see something happening, yes. You should see uh, our, our mentor, George Washington, with his Gmail account at the right-hand side of the screen and our fabulously attractive logo at the bottom. I see it right now. I hope other people do too, and I'm gonna mute my microphone so you can go on. Thanks, Will. So the Office of Privacy and Data Protection is, as Nona said, kind of a newish group. We've been in existence for about two years, uh, maybe a year and a half. And one of the things that we do is outreach and training for members of the public, your patrons um, in Washington State, about the state's privacy practices, about um, ways to protect their own privacy and ways that government can protect their privacy from government itself. Um, this has become quite challenging, challenging in the age of data breach when both public and private institutions have seen the number of um, really unfortunate uh, disclosures of uh, private information. We'll be covering a lot of that today. Again, I'm happy to answer questions uh, later on in the uh, process. Uh, I'm gonna move through the early parts of this uh, probably without taking questions and then we'll pause about halfway through. I'm happy to answer questions from the chat box to the extent that I can. It may take me a moment to orient. And if you have any particular topics that you'd like me to uh, address, um, we do use this presentation as a bit of a jumping off place and I'm happy to address other topics as well.
So the general outline of what we'll cover includes the legal landscape of privacy, um, some discussion of threats to privacy, government and otherwise. Uh, many of these topics and uh, outline elements come from our previous discussions with patrons and citizens around the state. These are the, object, the things that they most seem to care about. The legal landscape is of particular interest to me and Alex because we're both attorneys and we think it gives a nice foundation. Then we'll talk about technology as a game changer, in particular uh, Internet of Things and the data economy, uh, bet on surveillance. Uh, strategies and tools that we think can be useful and should be applied. And we'll wrap up with questions uh, in the middle and again at the end. So the history of privacy in the United States begins with this gentleman, Louis Brandeis, and his partner Samuel Warren, who wrote a Harvard Law Review article in uh, about this time of year in 1890, which is fairly old as technology goes, but fairly young as the law moves. Um, and in this uh, Harvard Law Review article, um, Louis Brandeis and his partner uh, tried to address the question of the right to be left alone, the right to privacy in the person, and the right to privacy in your work. Um, one of the interesting things about Brandeis's uh, position on privacy is that he felt it was a component of the right to be productive in your own way, that without the right to focus on the things that you are best at and the things that you can contribute to society, in other words, if you're constantly distracted, um, then the lack of time and attention to your own matters um, denies you the right to um, happiness and the pursuit of your profession, which is an unusual but interesting approach. He stated it like this, uh, the principle which protects personal writings and any other productions of the intellect or of the emotions is the right to privacy, meaning that without that, without that protection of privacy, your personal writings, your emotional, your art um, is not protected as well. In his mind, or in the mind of society at the time, was, uh, were a number of new technologies. In particular, Louis Brandeis was concerned about the yellow press, uh, or what was called at the time the yellow press. Many other members of the United States uh, legal fraternity and folks outside that fraternity as well um, we're interested in, in photography, which was a brand new technology at the time. An early uh, incident, not actually much of a case, but an early story that reveals uh, or points to some of the difficulties of new technologies is the case of the flower of the family and Abigail Roberson. Um, Ms. Roberson, who is pictured there on the right-hand side, um, was uh, an attractive young lady, uh, deemed a beauty in the Rochester uh, area, in 1902 and went in to explore a photography studio in her hometown. The photographer offered to take her picture and show her what photography was all about. She consented. They took a couple of photos, um, including this lovely um, but somewhat provocative image of the young lady with her shoulder exposed. And um, she went on her way. Um, some years later, the photographer uh, got an offer to sell a number of his photography plates, uh, his glass plate works. He did, and the flower of the family, Franklin Mills Flower, um, picked up this image and used it as uh, used it on the cover of their boxes. Um, much to the surprise of Ms. Roberson's family, when they noticed it strolling through the store one day, they were quite upset um, and complained rather volubly. But nothing, in fact. Uh, no violation, no criminal activity had, was deemed to have taken place. Um, it was legal for the, uh, the photographer to have taken the pictures. There was no, no controls on uh, how he might use those images. Um, and although they were in time able to secure a change in the flower of the family cover, this was an interesting example of sort of social outrage but uh, legal inaction. Moving along to 1928, some years later, um, the next big uh, legal precedent, at least for Washington state, comes from the Olmstead case. This was a wiretapping case regarding uh, Mr. Olmstead, who you see pictured there at various stages in his life. Mr. Olmstead was in law enforcement in Seattle, 
uh, and during Prohibition and somewhat thereafter became involved in the importation of um, intoxicating spirits from Canada. Um, he was particularly good at uh, figuring out how to make contact with boats and other surreptitious deliveries from our neighbor to the north uh, and became a very successful, although somewhat illegal, businessman after he was uh, removed from the police force. The manner of his removal was rather interesting. Um, he, law enforcement learned that he was uh, bringing in liquor uh, and that he made uh, very precise appointments with his suppliers by using telephones. So he would go to a particular telephone box at a particular time and do telephone calls where they arranged for a particular drop off. Um, and law enforcement naturally wanted to know what he was, what was being said. And they figured out a way to do that. It was a bit roundabout because in those days, these were completely manual telephone operators, uh, manual processes. But they arranged for operators to give essentially a hand sign to a law enforcement agent who was seated in the central office of the telephone company uh, and essentially alert them to what was going on on the conversation between Mr. Olmsted and his contacts. Um, Justice Taft, uh, when, the ca when the case came to the Supreme Court, wrote that this really was, again, no violation. There was no searching, he wrote. Um, there was no seizure. The evidence was secured by the use of the sense of hearing and that only. There was no entry of the houses or offices of the defendants. Now, in retrospect, Justice Taft is not often considered one of our leading historical jur uh, jurists. But as the author of the majority opinion, um, he set a precedent that was rather interesting. Justice Brandeis have, however, uh, now seated on the Supreme Court, had a more interesting dissent and one that has survived more favorably in history, uh, where he essentially lamented the lack of a privacy protection in the Constitution. The makers of our Constitution understood the need to secure conditions favorable to the pursuit of happiness, blah, blah, blah. Can it be that the Constitution affords no protection against such invasions of individual security? Can it be? Well, at the time, yes, it could be. Um, but not necessarily in Washington law. And we'll come back to Washington law in a little bit. Griswold v. Connecticut was the next major historical milestone for privacy. This was uh, a, a contraception case in 1965. Um, the lady on the left is uh, Ms. Griswold. She was head of Planned Parenthood. And they essentially uh, arranged for a test case uh, on a Connecticut statute that prohibited the distribution of uh, contraceptives even to married couples. Um, it also allowed, uh, pro prohibited um, information uh, dissemination to those couples on how to use it and what uh, might be uh, the outcome. The Griswold case was the first example of privacy champions making major uh, progress against um, a lack of uh, clear law. Um, Griswold was able to establish the precedent that one does have privacy against government uh, laws and intrusion in your own home. Um, there were a number of other things that were decided in the case also, and it's a famous case for many reasons. But this was really the beginning of the modern view of privacy in American law. The most recent and perhaps the most interesting is this case from California, Riley, uh, Mr. Riley on the left. Uh, and uh, Chief Justice Roberts on the right, who wrote the majority opinion. Mr. Riley um, was a suspect in a number of, uh, in a couple of incidents in Los Angeles. Um, he was stopped in a traffic stop for what else? An expired uh, license plate tab. During the process of examining his car, uh, law enforcement officers found his cell phone and arrested him, believing that he was a suspect in other cases, um, and without a warrant, explored his cell phone, found pictures, texts, images that connected him with a, uh, with a gang in the area, and led to his indictment on a couple of criminal charges regarding a gangland shooting. The case made its way, actually two cases made their way through the legal system and were decided in 2014. The majority opinion by Justice Roberts for the first time ever in American history said that you have um, 
the right to expect a subpoena or a warrant um, for the search of a personal cell phone, basically that you have um, you have some privacy uh, expectation in your personal devices. As you can see, there's been a long and growing history, starting in 1890 with uh, the right to privacy uh, article in the Harvard Law Review. Um, the first privacy statutes actually came on the books in 1904 in uh, New York. Uh, there's a couple in Washington as well. Um, but it really wasn't until the 1960s and 1970s that the United States began to take a more serious view of the concept of privacy as a right. Today, of course, we have HIPAA, um, we have um, COPPA, FERPA, all of the PAWS, um, statutes that protect specific areas of privacy or privacy in specific areas of your life. Could be education, children, uh, health materials, um, FCC governed, FCC rules recently uh, reversed, essentially, um, protected your browsing history through your ISP and so on. But there's been a, a relatively rapid expansion in the number and the breadth of cases looking at privacy in the United States. What are the threats to privacy and what is uh, the things that have been driving this increased concern include government itself, uh, including surveillance uh, and just the, uh, the nature of government. Um, also corporate activities, which would include data breaches and criminals who are the other half of data breaches. But I think one of the things that's come to our attention uh, over the last couple of years looking at what people do is that sometimes the greatest threat to an individual's privacy is their friends, family members, and even their own um, lack of attention, so other people. Anybody know this guy? Edward Snowden? Yes, I think everybody probably does. Um, the interesting thing about the Snowden case, uh, Mr. Snowden was a contractor for the National Security Agency, also known as No Such Agency, um, and blew the whistle on mass surveillance by the NSA of American citizens and foreign nationals. This was revealed several years ago, predominantly through The Guardian, but through a consortium of newspapers. It was a pretty big story at the time. I think it still probably is. One of the more interesting things for privacy as a cause and as a developing concept in the United States is that it led to a significant amount of internal, international uh, strife between the US and our European and South American allies. Um, the European Union in 2015, on the basis of a law student's uh, case, um, eliminated or broke, terminated the safe harbor treaty that had been protecting the rights of American technology companies to do business in Europe uh, as being uh, and judged uh, adequate protection for the privacy rights of European citizens. In Europe, the right to privacy is just that, it's a right, um, and it's much more seriously protected than it is under US law. The end of the Safe Harbor Treaty in 2015 was, of course, a major problem for U.S. technology companies and for anybody who was looking to work uh, across borders from and with the United States. Uh, Brazil, at the same time, um, was also extremely upset and began to pursue both data localism and lash out uh, in rather interesting ways against American technology companies that they perceive to be security or privacy risk to their student, to their citizens. Microsoft has become quite an active um, litigant and uh, participant in um, movements regarding federal surveillance and the privacy of their customers, partially of necessity and partially out of interest. But in the nature of Government, state government, in some cases, really needs to use uh, things that in other hands might be considered um, difficulties for privacy. In particular, we've been using biometric identifiers for a number of years. Biometric identifiers are things that measure your body. Uh, they're things like fingerprints. Um, in recent years, technology has enabled us to use iris photography, facial recognition, et cetera, and to make it fairly easy for computers to identify a person based on an image. 
The leading example right now is the enhanced driver's license for Washington state citizens and a number of other states as well. If you're planning on using your driver's license to fly or cross the Canadian border, um, it needs to be one of these enhanced driver's license that includes biometric uh, identification. But in private hands, we'll be much more cautious of these things. Government uses a variety of private data and kind of has to do some level of surveillance for several different functions related to law enforcement. But in general, as an organization, government tends to be or is encouraged to be much more cautious about the use of other technologies like um, drones. Um, drones are offer the opportunity to invade people's privacy with almost trivial ease. They also offer the opportunity for people to surveil their neighbors and, and friends, again, with trivial ease. Body cameras uh, have been much in the attention of the public recently, Seattle being one of the nationwide national leaders on the use of body cameras by police, by law enforcement. Um, Plate readers, traffic cameras, and smart cities have all been um, pretty actively used by cities throughout the Northwest. Uh, and they offer tremendous value in terms of how a city is managed and how it delivers services. But um, they need to be balanced with an increased concern for citizen privacy. There was an interesting work group report out yesterday in the legislature here in Washington, or actually the 29th of November, uh, there was a legislative working group looking at how do you handle the public records impacts of having so many law enforcement officers recording video essentially any time that they're on the street. Drones, body cameras, and other technology things. The challenge of big data in the Internet of Things um, and the challenge of the value of citizen data or patron data uh, as a data product, as an asset of private companies has become a real issue of concern for us and for a lot of other folks as well. Um, data can be used for consumer profiling. Um, many of the online companies that we know and love um, have databases of up to 50,000 points of information regarding each one of their customers. Um, data analytics can be used to draw really very significant conclusions, even without the use of a name or a specifically identifying uh, field. Um, the Internet of Things, of course, diversifies and spreads the availability of data and technology intrusions into people's homes and uh, lives much more broadly than it ever was before. Um, I'm, let's see, in the absence of... Uh, in the absence of a lot of feedback, I'm going to guess that most of you have heard of the Internet of Things but are not particularly familiar with it. Um, Internet of Things devices include things like um, home security cameras, uh, things that can open your door so that Amazon can drop off your packages inside your house, not on the porch. Uh, it includes things like uh, baby monitoring devices, anything that is essentially... Um, a small box that connects to the internet, a network connected appliance, usually of a small size, doing some limited um, function. It can also be used in everything from agriculture to uh, water irrigation and so on. They're small devices that help collect a tremendous amount of data about whatever system it is that they monitor. And the thing about Internet of Things uh, devices is that they tend to be less well developed and less well protected from a cybersecurity perspective. So they offer new types of data, new types of identifiers, uh, and new ways for um, data regarding individuals in Washington to leak or be deliberately circulated. We'll come back to the details of this in a little bit. This might be a good place to pause for questions, if there are any. Is this a, a good time, Nona? I would say it's as good as any. It's really up to you. If there are questions, uh, would someone be able to call them to my attention? Um, I have not seen any questions coming in on chat yet. Sorry, well, I didn't respond. I couldn't put my unmute button. But no, that's back. quite all right. But I'm so gonna... far, I have not seen any questions. If um, I'll keep my eye out if any more come, come in. So. Sounds good. I will push on. There's lots to cover. 
Okay. So the way that we handle privacy concerns with technology companies in the United States is based on privacy policies. And I suspect that everyone on board this morning has seen at least the top 20% of a company privacy policy, meaning the part that you can see in the browser window when you first bring up the privacy page or in order to click the, yes, I accept these terms and convey to you all kinds of rights and privileges that I didn't really bother to read. But where did they come from? Um, privacy policies were initially a voluntary commitment uh, by companies um, that were meant to inspire confidence uh, in users and in their customers about how the company intended to handle people's privacy. Since we don't have actual rights of privacy in most statutory contexts in the United States, uh, most of our privacy is handled through contract law. This is an example of an early privacy policy drafted by uh, my colleague Alex Albin, the state privacy officer, when he was working for Starwave, now part of Disney. Uh, this is a, and it's a lovely example of a relatively early privacy policy that offers an interesting transition. So at the beginning, the Walt Disney privacy uh, policy recites it has a rich tradition of bringing great stories, characters, and experiences to our guests around the world. And our sites and applications are created to entertain and con connect guests with the best that we have to offer. Privacy policy is designed to provide transparency into our privacy practices and principles in a format that our guests can navigate, read, and understand. We are dedicated to reading your personal information with care and respect. Interestingly, that's meant predominantly to convey a sense of confidence for customers and to demonstrate a voluntary commitment by the company. The second half gets a bit more into detail. It's perhaps a bit fresher. Uh, this privacy policy describes the treatment of information provided or collected on the sites where the privacy policy is posted. It also explains the treatment of information provided or collected on applications we make available to third-party platforms or sites if disclosed to you in connection with the use of the application. We follow this privacy policy in accordance with local law in the places where we operate. Now we're getting into a bit more of the details. But the point is that our privacy policy and our privacy protections in the United States come originally from voluntary commitments by major companies and contract law, or to, the, to some extent, um, consumer protection law regarding uh, unfair and deceptive practices. Today, the way that the Federal Trade Commission, which is the chief regulator of privacy-related matters at the federal level, pursues most of its cases is by um, addressing gaps in a company's adherence to its privacy policy. So a privacy policy, if not followed, um, offers the possibility that the company is doing unfair and deceptive trade practices, saying we're protecting your privacy in this way and then actually doing business in a different way. So it's, a, um, it's not as strong a legal method of, appro of approaching privacy concerns as the Europeans have, but it's the best we got for now. But fundamentally, one of the things that people need to be protected from is their own, or that people should be concerned about, is their own inattention. And in fact, this is the weakness of privacy policies as currently constituted in the United States. Um, people are remarkably willing to click that little box and click right on through conveying God knows what to the company that posted the agreement. Here's an example of one particularly uh, insidious and somewhat amusing uh, case from uh, 2010. Um, a site was put up online um, that, in order to, that had a, an agreement whereby you conveyed, sold your um, immortal soul to uh, Mephistopheles, the winged gentleman there on the right-hand side of the picture. It was, of course, a joke, um, but it, like any good joke. It has uh, only a little bit of humor and quite a bit of poignancy. People's inattention has also led to the growth of cybercrime. And I suspect that many of you have heard about the Yahoo breach. Um, at the time uh, of the initial breach, uh, there were over 500 million customer accounts uh, compromised. It now looks like that number is more like um, 2 billion. Uh, and that, in fact, Yahoo um, had difficulty 
determining what had been taken and how many and had further difficulty um, admitting to the breach. The net effect of this massive breach of uh, customer proprietary personal information was essentially a cost reduction as Yahoo sold itself to Verizon and became what is now called Oath, um, which is an interesting and I think somewhat sad commentary on the state of privacy in the US. There have been a number of other major breaches. In fact, the majority of uh, American citizens at this point have been involved in some kind of a data breach. 128 million in the Panama, uh, the Panama Institute estimated some years ago. I think uh, with the advent of um, more advanced uh, tools available on the dark web for hackers, um, there's really quite a library of uh, utilities out there available for people who want to become kind of super amateurs. And it's one of the trends that we've heard about a lot is that uh, it's getting easier and easier for hackers to get their hands on more sophisticated tools that enable them to do more damage to people's privacy, in part because of um, leaked or lost um, algorithms produced by major companies and governments. Foreign hacking of domestic databases has actually been uh, an increasing problem and has gotten more attention than we might originally have expected. Um, the Office of Personal Management had a major breach, the Democratic National Committee. It's much in the news today with uh, a number of investigations ongoing. But there have been data breaches from essentially every major sector in the American economy. Technology companies like Adobe, AOL, AT&T, um, but also retail companies like Home Depot, um, Target, Sony, uh, Zappos, and many more. This is not a particularly, it's not limited to technology companies or to any particular sector of the economy. It's a systemic failure, and it's something that needs to be addressed. The, sky, the size and scale and frequency of these uh, breaches has increased dramatically uh, from 2012 to uh, the latest, although this is leaving out this slide omits probably the biggest and one of the most talked about breaches um, in recent years. But you can see that, again, it's not uniquely a private sector problem either. Uh, the voter database from Georgia with 191 million, I believe, names uh, and uh, items compromised. Uh, it's not peculiar to uh, technology companies, not peculiar to uh, the private sector. And of course, most recently, I'm sure everyone has heard uh, about the Equifax breach. Uh, 143 million people, um, including a number of Canadian citizens as well, um, had, their, uh, had significant aspects of their private information compromised over a period of many months. Um, Equifax's response to the matter, I think, may have caused them even more difficulty than the initial breach uh, in that the measures that they've taken to help people freeze their credit or enable people to freeze their credit um, have been almost as problematic as uh, the underlying business. So for example, it's our understanding now that the Equifax webpage that enables you to freeze your credit is placing third-party trackers uh, on people's computers so that they can monetize uh, the addresses and the browsing activities of people going to the Equifax site to uh, freeze their credit and protect their privacy. Um, these kinds of practices, we believe, will lead to um, a very different industry in a few years. These things need to change, and a higher standard should and must be expected. This is returning to the Internet of Things matter. Um, those of you who have not heard of the Mirai botnet attack, this was one of the interesting, the most large scale attack on the underpinnings of the internet uh, pretty much in history. And it came from um, the enslavement and deployment of uh, what they call a botnet, a, a network of uh, corrupted devices all over the world um, in Europe, Russia, the Middle East, Africa, the United States, South America. All of these little dots represent compromised machines that were used to attack some of the underpinning sites on the internet. Um, interestingly, the nature of this attack uh, was unusual in that it was focused on the internet of things. Uh, and it, the home 
uh, home security cameras, the um, baby monitors, the automatic door locks, things that are internet connected, um, but lack the ability to get uh, regular security updates. Um, for those of you who have computers at home, and I think that's pretty much everybody, you probably are aware of the necessity for doing regular patches and updates to uh, your home and work computers, but do you also update your nanny cams? Technology has always been uh, a game changer for privacy. People's concepts in 1890 and in 1902 uh, were challenged by uh, plate photography and then by uh, telephones in the 20s, as we saw in the Olmsted case and in the, uh, the early cases we discussed. But today the pace is even faster. Um, with miniaturization of cameras, with uh, the advent of automatic machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, massive data analytics, we're developing a concept um, that has been described as fog computing. Essentially, computing that happens in so many distributed places at, in between um, sort of your home or your wrist and the servers in the data center, both of which tend to be um, more noticeable to people. The, the number of computations that can be done by um, the number of devices currently able to produce them or to do computations uh, makes it tremendously difficult to protect privacy um, when these devices are all over our lives. Now, what me worry, huh? Don't we, do we really have privacy anymore? Um, how do we protect privacy? How, what hope do we have of preserving some privacy in a massively interconnected world? Um, consumers have widely adopted um, lots of new devices. How many of you are wearing, look at your wrist, see if you're wearing uh, an Apple Watch or uh, a Samsung Watch or essentially a computer on your wrist. And this is not the Dick Tracy uh, watch, uh, watch radio. This is something that can think and has a brain of its own. Many of these devices are only minimally or not at all reprogrammable. So when something or if something is compromised or discovered, uh, it's very difficult to repair, recover, uh, safeguard things uh, that have been placed out in uh, homes and all over the network. Remember that webcam you bought last Christmas? Is it still operating in your home? Uh, and when was the last time it was updated? Many of these devices collect and store your personal data and we urge people to be very cautious with them. One of the more insidious developments we've seen recently, and this is really only in the last couple of years, is the development of uh, artificially intelligence enhanced and network connected toys. Um, this is something that we found particularly difficult. This is Hello Barbie. Um, Hello Barbie, as you can see, has a, a, a really uh, a, a lovely startling and uh, dramatic outfit. Um, including a microphone in her necklace. Um, the speaker and lights embedded in her necklace make it sparkly and attractive. Uh, it urges the, um, the child playing with the doll to press the, act the button on her belt to activate a microphone and begin a conversation with Hello Barbie. Uh, when this happens, the child's voice is recorded. Barbie will pose a question, will record the answer, and will actually post for parental review, um, these voice recordings of everything the child says. Now, children have a limited, in fact, no privacy expectation from their parents. Uh, as the parent of two children myself, I understand the difficulty. Um, but it has seemed to us fairly creepy that um, a toy that the child may not actually understand was recording their voice and reporting it to their parents through a website where the parents could review um, this handy voice, uh, you know, sonogram, or not sonogram, but the sound print uh, of the actual statements by the child and the questions posed by Barbie. Creepier than that, however, is this example, the cloud pets. Um, those of you who wish to uh, can go out and find much more information about this on the internet. There was a relatively small company that was making these remarkably um, up-to-date and network-connected stuffed animals, sort of Teddy Ruxpin for the internet age. Um, these cloud pets, remarkably cute little creatures, included a microphone and um, could have conversations based on um, AI routines and uh, networked uh, materials from the parent company. 
again, um, the trouble was that they did not include automatic updates or security patches as time went on. And the teddy bears leaked the account information of over 800,000 people. Hackers were able to penetrate their security and turn the dolls, these stuffed animals into um, listening stations or in fact paralyze the dolls completely. If you'd like, you can go out and see the, the, this YouTube video we believe is still available, but the cloud pets themselves are no more. If you're thinking about buying one for Christmas, um, that would be very difficult and we would highly recommend you think uh, of something else. Here's an example of a German similar experience. Kayla was a, uh, uh, a, a doll with a built-in voice recorder and the ability to do conversations with children. Um, but being tar targeted at uh, the German market, it was subject to European and German privacy regulations. And Kayla met an awful fate, which I will now uh, somewhat relate, um, although the hour is rather late. Kayla was deemed to be a threat to privacy and parents were instructed by the German government to actually get together and destroy Kayla by crushing or removing the head of the doll um, because otherwise the compromised electronics inside were not repairable, not updatable, and could not be, um, could not be made safe from um, hacker intrusion and became listening devices in every home in which they were located. Um, Germans took it quite seriously and all of these dolls were destroyed. I'm sure if my daughter had had one, um, I would have been the least popular parent on the planet if I had uh, gone and destroyed Kayla. Here's an interesting device, relatively recent and new to the market. Um, one that called uh, Echo Look, which is a uh, um, an echo-based or an Alexa-based uh, artificial intelligence and voice-controlled camera. Um, it's interesting in that its intended purpose, as we understand it, is to let you look at what you might look at, look like, or see what you might look like in different kinds of outfits. Um, perhaps deciding whether you want to wear the fetching raincoat on the right or the summery outfit in the middle before leaving the house in the morning but it contains a fairly high resolution camera and is taking uh, and processing images of um, this model's uh, body size and shape in order to uh, figure out what clothes might fit. Um, so again, things that um, take pictures, take essentially measurements of people's body and images um, uh, constitute or are close to constituting um, privacy issues for folks. We have long anticipated the Internet of Humans, the um, advanced technology, the merger of uh, humanity with technology. Uh, those of you who uh, remember Steve and the Six Million Dollar Man show from the 1970s might be interested to consider what were the properties, what were the things that they managed to enhance him in order to rebuild him and make him stronger through technology. This is going back a number of years, but what was it? He had bionic ears. Of course, you can have bionic ears too now. Um, you can probably buy them on, online through any major retailer. These are uh, devices we found that are specifically designed with a convenient mobile app so that you can listen to other conversations in the cafe uh, or on the street as you're uh, sitting across from somebody's office. Um, most people don't realize that there's a remarkable number of things people say in outdoor cafes over surprisingly unprivate conversations. Bionic eyes, I believe he had x-ray vision. Well, x-ray vision is not that far out. In fact, it's here. Um, we believe this was taken in uh, uh, an airport security line, but not from, the, uh, not from the thing that people think of as the x-ray. Um, there are now what they call passive or backscatter x-ray devices that can see through um, ordinary suitcases and see through uh, ordinary devices without actually producing a signal uh, and can be deployed somewhat surreptitiously in a van or um, to a variety of locations. 
One of the things that Washington State is particularly concerned about and that we are, have been working to um, protect or improve or one of the areas where we think we might actually be able to turn the tide is on biometrics. Biometrics have a number of things that make them special. They're unique characteristics. Um, and in fact, that is what biometrics are, is there, it's the use of uh, things that are unique to you as an individual, not just your personal data so much as um, the, the separation of your eyes, the color of your eyes, the pattern of your body. Um, and these cannot be changed. If your password is hacked and compromised, you can make up a new password, but you can't really make up a new finger if your fingerprint is, is compromised. Um, so the authenticity and usability of biometric data, uh, we believe requires a much higher standard of care than um, has traditionally been applied. Now, law enforcement agencies um, have a long history of appropriately handling um, things like fingerprints and so on. But in recent years, we've seen the Washington State Legislature last year took uh, action on two very interesting bills, one limiting state agencies' use of biometrics and the other applying to private sector companies. We believe this is an area where the horse is, for once, not out of the barn ahead of us. Uh, we may, be, may not be too late to uh, implement significant protections. Once the data is collected, where does it go? Who keeps it? Can it be shared? Can it be sold? These are the elements of regulation. Um, how long is it retained? How do you control privacy and the movement of personal data in an economy and in the world? These are the things that the Privacy Office seeks to um, monitor um, as they're done by state agencies and as they occur in private sector uh, incidents in Washington State. We have a couple of, a number of strategies that we can bring to bear. Uh, because Washington state law is a little special. Um, Washington state's constitution was one of the, in fact, it was the last state constitution adopted. Um, and it was, it came after the advent of the concept of privacy uh, in um, Brandeis's 1890 article. And article one, section seven of the Washington state constitution actually offers protection to people to be uh, undisturbed in their private affairs. It's the only state constitution that does that. Um, interestingly, there's relatively few laws on the books, even in Washington state, that make that right um, a specific element of statute or code. But um, we were interested to discover that if you really want to send highly secure private communications, there's very significant criminal penalties that attach to disclosure of a telegram. The most secure and private form of communication in the country is the telegram, or at least in Washington state. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to find telegram offices anymore, um, and the law has not succeeded in updating telegraph law to apply to text messages, for example. Washington state has not only a strong protection for privacy in the constitution, we also have strong protection for transparency in the Public Records Act. Um, there are eight exemptions that apply to different aspects of privacy, but fundamentally Washington state law protects um, the citizens' access to anything held by government, any records, any information held by government. This is why we believe in open data and why I've had so much fun working with agencies in the last couple of years to, rather than wait for the public records request, publish anything that you can affirmatively so people can find it when they want it, not wait for you to provide it. Uh, we also have a strong data breach law that requires reporting to at least two different agencies. Um, and we have been, Washington State has been very generous over the years in uh, giving up what's known as sovereign immunity. So the limits on uh, lawsuit damages against Washington State government uh, are not limited by uh, the principle that states can refuse to be tried in court. Washington can be. It makes Washington... Um, uh, very committed to both transparency and privacy and makes us different from a number of other jurisdictions. In order to address these, uh, what we see as the gaps and problems, uh, we've focused on a concept from records management known as the life cycle of data. Um, the idea that um, it begins with any 
operation or project involving personal data begins with a design phase, includes the collection, processing, storage, sharing, but ultimately it will actually come to the point where you need to delete and get rid of that data. And this is part of any records, records management um, process for government and for most companies as well. So we urge uh, agencies and companies to think about what they can do at each step in this cycle, knowing that you will come back to it again and again. And actually at each step in the cycle, there are things that you can do as an organization to protect your customers and citizens, your patrons and so on. Um, when you're designing a system, we ask government agencies and others to minimize the amount of data that's collected. You don't really, do you really need someone's social security number in order to issue them a dog permit or a dog license? Um, training, when you're collecting uh, information, make sure that the people who collect it are trained so that it's collected properly and has the meaning that you intend. Uh, when you're processing it, honor your privacy policy that you're, so that you're not um, compromising people's privacy and exposing yourself to um, allegations of unfair and deceptive practices. Use best practices like encryption to store and process the data so that even if there is some kind of a breach, not everything can be stolen or exfiltrated, as they say, uh, from your system. Deduplication, don't keep more than one copy if you don't need it. When you share it, and we do recommend that agencies share their data both with private and public sector stakeholders, do it under a data sharing agreement. Know the shares that you're doing um, and track how those uh, partners are performing. Um, everyone should be prepared for a breach. When you're using data, take that time also to prepare for a breach. Um, there are two kinds of organizations, those that have not been breached and those that uh, think they have not been breached, or those that have been breached and those that think they have not been breached. Um, privacy impact assessment is a, an emerging best practice of both for public and private sector entities. Uh, basically, it's how bad could it be? How much should we be worrying? What degree of private, private information do we keep? And how well are we keeping it? Um, these are services available from consultants and increasingly from um, agency folks like us. Um, records, uh, use records uh, carefully, have a good archive, manage them appropriately, um, and delete them when you can. We have a program that we call Privacy Modeling that helps government agencies and small organizations spot issues when they're in the, uh, in the early stages or in the late stages of uh, managing uh, someone's data. A rather long and complicated description, but the basic message is keep as little as you can, do as little as you need, and be as attentive as you possibly can. But there, it is possible to take simple measures that really improve people's privacy protections. These are sensible public privacy principles, and it's what we recommend to agencies and to um, anybody operating with uh, citizen data in Washington State. Ask yourself, is there a less invasive technology solution? Do you really need a network connected stuffed animal? Um, obtain user consent um, and obtain it frequently and in context. This is one of the areas where European law and European practice is diverging from United States practice. Um, the fact that you consented to the collection of your information for the purpose of getting a, uh, an animal permit in 2004 does not mean that you've given your consent for law enforcement to use that same data to track your vehicle. Um, so obtain consent, informed consent, and what they call consent in context. Localized storage, um, meaning if you don't need to transmit stuff across the internet or to a third party uh, data uh, host, don't. You know, um, don't transmit data you don't need to transmit. Um, have you thought about the life cycle of the data? Uh, knowing that when you create it or when you collect it that you will have to destroy it eventually. Um, we recommend keeping tight restrictions on data sharing, but doing it to the extent um, that it offers value. Um, and it usually does offer value. It's better to share data in an explicit way than to hoard or duplicate data in less reliable forms. And fundamentally, we act when we can to uh, exempt from Public Records Act uh, uh, records that are potentially uh, privacy risks. So we believe in public records, we also believe in privacy. And bringing those two together, or harmonizing them, uh, it creates a fascinating kind of a tango um, that will be going on for several years now. Um, and that's really the 
the meat of the presentation we like to give to state employees and to library patrons. We've offered this in a number of locations around Washington State and are happy to offer it further uh, if anyone is interested. Um, we do run a privacy website called privacy.wa.gov, which I'm happy to demonstrate, and I'd be happy to take comments and questions. Um, so, well, we have had some questions come in. Liz um, wondered, what is spear phishing, which you used, you used that term earlier in the presentation. Spear phishing comes from phishing, uh, and phishing comes from, well, phishing is the practice of uh, getting people to click on links in email. Um, you've probably seen security warnings or um, uh, received actual e phishing attacks, emails from unknown sources that invite you to, hey, click this link to see a cool video or click this link to download my cool new app. Um, not all of those folks have your best interests at heart. Uh, in fact, many of them don't. Spear phishing uh, means the targeted fishing of um, particularly big game fish. If you think of uh, when you're scuba diving in those fabulous Hawaiian waters, um, what kinds of things might you use a, a, you know, a, a spear gun to, um, to get? And they would be the large big game fish. Spear fishing is often undertaken by sophisticated hackers or other countries to identify, for example, a member of the Democratic National Committee and try to uh, send them a particular, particularly attractive uh, email that would get them to click on a link and compromise their cybersecurity. It's been a very attractive and successful way of compromising even the security practices of good, um, uh, responsible companies. Um, next, well, Mary um, said, it's easy to see why people get careless when it seems like there's nothing one can do, Equifax, et cetera. I hope Will will give some recommendations. And I, you, that was written before you went along and, and did talk about ways to protect ourselves. So I'm not sure, Mary, whether you um, still would like him to address that or um, let me scroll down a little bit. There are a couple comments from me. This was mainly curiosity. The whole Hello Barbie doll just horrified me. And I wondered, it said that it's for parents to listen to it, but is it broadcast so others can also intrude on what these kids are talking about with their toys? The difference, you know? the difference between what a parent can listen to and what a hacker can listen to is really just one security update. So, uh, you know, the, the first, when initially released, um, these devices include some degree of uh, privacy or anonymity protection. But as time goes on, just about any kind of electronic device will, um, people will discover gaps or um, shortcomings in the computer code that enable hackers to compromise them. It's been the experience with computers and, um, you know, credit card terminals and any other electronic device you can think of. Um, the distinguishing characteristic of Internet of Things, in particular toys, is that they're not often updated. When your computer, uh, if your computer code is if it develops a flaw, you can update it. Um, in fact, many of the systems will do that automatically. But that's not usually the case with Internet of Things and particularly toys. Children are not usually trained or prepared to do the kinds of updates that adults know is, are necessary. Um, I'm going to skip over a couple more comments to move to some questions. Um, John wondered, what help does OPDP and the State Library offer to public libraries regarding planning for a breach response? So, and, go on. Um, one of the things that we, one of the things that, well, the easy, the simple answer is that when we do demonstrations or presentations in libraries around the state, we always provide, or we like to provide, um, some manuals and reference information that we've gotten from the Federal Trade Commission. Federal Trade Commission does a lot of good research and publishes some simple guides for small organizations on how to be prepared for data breach, um, how to handle people's uh, uh, information appropriately. Um, so we do, when we 
do presentations in libraries. We uh, circulate copies of some materials that we think are useful. If you'd like, I'd be happy to post links to those materials on uh, our website or to circulate them to the attendees. You can get those same documents for your library and for your patron direct from the Federal Trade Commission for free. Um, the other thing is for state agencies, um, there's a there's a group within the office of the CIO known as the Office of Cybersecurity uh, that helps agencies prepare for data breach and have responsible plans in place. But that doesn't necessarily help uh, individual public libraries. So, Will, if you send me those links after the webinar, we send everyone a link to the recording, and I can include those links in in that email if that if that will work for you. That sounds good. Yes, I'd be happy to. And I also was going to say, it is 10 o'clock. I don't know if you need to go, Will, but there are a few more questions, and we um, we are recording it. So if you're willing to um, stay on for a few more minutes and answer questions, anyone who's interested can go back and listen to the recording. Do you have that time? Do I do have time. I'm, I'm at your okay. disposal for as long as you'd like. Okay. So next question um, from TAC, it's customs and border patrols don't need permission to search U.S. citizens' cell phones. Is that correct? Uh, that is that is correct. Um, as I understand it, when you're crossing the border, you're not subject to the laws that would protect you once you're here. Okay. Uh, and in fact, there's been a fair amount of attention to that uh, in the last few months in the news media. Okay. And then John... Um, has a follow-up question, I think, to the one he asked earlier about what, how could you help libraries. He said, are there evaluations of various ILS platforms and third-party library databases regarding their privacy and security practices? Ooh, that's a really interesting question, and I don't know the answer. And um, I, yeah, I'll see if I can, I can talk to um, the other Will, the Will who works here in the office who does yes. our statewide database licensing and see if he has any information about that. And if I have anything, I'll also include that in the email. Um, so I'm going to now go up to, there were a couple of comments. Could I, could yeah. I go back to that follow-up question? Absolutely. There is one protection that libraries can take and have taken um, in a number of, I mean, pretty broadly throughout the country, and that is just minimizing the data. Um, so, if you have a system that's designed to be open and contains, you know, no personally identifiable information or contains it for as little time as possible, then you can reduce the risk. And it's my understanding that most library ILS systems, for example, don't record in a persistent way who has, you know, who's been reading what. Uh, much to the chagrin of the FBI in the Whatcom uh, Deming uh, library case from 2004. So there were just a couple more comments, more than questions. Um, Sue said, I'd like to see our social security numbers better protected that and feels that companies should be prohibited from asking for them, which I tend to agree with. But <laughs> anyway, so that was a comment. And then this, the last one was really just a question for me, which is my health club uses a fingerprint scan for sign-in, which has felt really creepy to me. But you were talking about biometrics and how biometrics are a really good way to kind of keep, keep your information safe. So I just wondered how you, I don't like the fact that they're storing my fingerprint, but I gave it away. So I guess I don't, I'm kind of out of luck, but how do you feel about that as a, as a, practice for for businesses where you need to sign in like that we think that the use of biometrics needs to be very carefully controlled and that people need to be asked mm -hmm. uh, that you need to consent and i think that's basically what the washington state legislature said in those two laws uh, from last session that if you're going to be using biometrics um, you have to be extra specially careful so if your health club has implemented that system since last year, um, there's new law that would require them to um, be very careful about getting your consent, saying, hey, do you want to do this? And offering you the opportunity to not do it. Um, the opportunity not to do something is an incredibly valuable tool for protecting your privacy. Um, just opting out or not opting in. So yeah, it gives me the creeps. Um, 
and I, uh, I don't know what your health club might be, but I'd urge them to be extra careful about how they manage that data because it could be, it could be breached, it could be revealed. Yeah. Um, many of the fingerprint and iris scanners that are used for building access tend to store that data only on the device itself, so they don't transmit it over the network. Um, but, you know, the more you have, the more you can lose. Yeah, well, like I said, it, it gave me the creeps, but I went right along with it, kind of like clicking the, oh, yes, I agree to this without reading it that we all do. So um, that was all of the questions. And um, unless anyone else has something more to ask, I'd like to say thank you all. This has been really fascinating and a little terrifying, but those toys really gave me the creeps. Um, and for anyone who's here, we have been recording. We will be sending out a link to the webinar soon. Um, the person who does all that processing is out for a couple days. So usually we get it out the, the afternoon after the webinar. It may not show up for a couple days, but never fear, it will be on its way to you soon. And thank you, Will. Really, really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you very much. I commend to your attention our website, uh, privacy.wa.gov, which includes tools, the opportunity to contact us and ask questions. And I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with all of you today. We do offer this program for libraries around the state. And uh, one last thing, there is that survey once you close down your Zoom window. If you have a few seconds, it's just four questions and we'd really appreciate it. Thanks everyone.